Welcome to episode 83 of Uncontained. I'm your host, Aaron Static Render, and on the show today, I have voice actor, poet, and philosopher Kabir Singh. Uh, this episode and episodes like this one are the reason I love doing this show because I get to ask questions to people who are doing things that I'm either intrigued by or, in this case, interested in actually doing. Yes, I've. it's no secret. If you listen to the show, you've probably heard me talk about me wanting to do voiceover and get in to sit down and pick the brain of a voice actor and, you know, get, to, get some tips, get some inside information if there is any to be gotten. It's really cool to be able to talk to people that can possibly lead you in the right direction or at least give you the advice to get started in your right direction. And that's what I hope to provide to a lot of people as well, whether you're interested in becoming a comedian, whether you're interested in becoming a musician or a producer or whatever. I try to have a little bit of everybody on the show. With this one, I, I'm interested in becoming a voice actor, and it was really cool being able to ask the questions I've been wanting to ask for a while. So... This episode, coming your way, number 83, with voice actor, poet, and philosopher, Kabir Singh. Welcome, Kabir, and how are you doing today? Oh, brother, I'm doing just fine, man. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for joining me. You are actually doing one of the careers that I myself would like to get into, and that is voice acting. Let's just take a step back to the beginning of your voiceover career. How did you get into voiceover? Oh, man, that's a good question, brother. You know, uh, I, I like to say that definitely I'm one of those people that didn't have connections in voiceover. A lot of people, they assume that in order to be in Hollywood, you got to have Hollywood connections. Technology has made it so that you don't it's not necessary. And um, for me, I was working, a, you know, nine to five, I did four years working for a corporate uh, legal department. And um, I always wanted to find out ways I can make money using my voice. I wrote poetry as a kid. I always used to sit there and write poetry. You know, it was like a way for me to express myself. But I figured when I got older, it's, it's hard to make money in poetry. So <laughs> um, I, I started researching then. And I came across a book. It's a very good book. And I recommend it to all people who start. You can't learn voice acting from a book, but you can learn the business of voice acting from a book. Okay. And and that book is uh, James Allberger's author, and it's called The Art of Voice Acting. It's a great book. I started that. I picked it up, and uh, the journey began there, man. I started uh, taking classes and researching, and this was probably around 2006. All right. So what were you doing before you got into voiceover? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so when I graduated college uh, in 2008, I got a job working uh, for a, a legal department in El Segundo. So I would drive, I'd commute, the, you know, 45 miles from near Pomona to El Segundo. Um, and I did it for four years. I'd wake up at five, get there about seven. Did I was a contract administrator. I look over contracts from, uh, you know, legal facilities and doctor facilities. Uh, it wasn't something I wanted to do. But when you graduate college, you got debt. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, you got to take, especially during 2008, the economy was so bad, man. So I took, I took what I can get, and that was a good job, man. It was one of those jobs where you're like, oh, okay, I can see myself here, and then grow and climb the ladder of the corporate entity and make my way up to director one day in 15 years. But <laughs> it was quick for me to understand because the first two years I was there, bro, I was so negative. I walked around with a negative energy. Um, I walked around in depression almost because life hits you in the face and it teaches you that, hey. What you expected you to be at 23 years old is not what it is. And now real life hits you. So, you know, quickly my energy uh, was very negative. So I had to get up out that mindset. It took me two years to actually plan, like, I get it, my exit, you know, into voiceover. Yeah. So what was it that uh, finally made you uh, take that leap out of the legal profession into voiceover? What set you on your path? Yeah, I, cr I created it. I created it because, um, see, everybody wants to do, everybody wants to do shit. I was a cat who wanted to do shit, you know, but you can't do shit if you don't have a plan. So I created a plan. What did my plan include? Well, for me, it was, uh, okay, I'm two years into this job. I got a little bit of money saved, maybe like three grand or something. Uh, what can I do? 
So I was like, all right, my plan. I started learning stuff. I even tried stand-up comedy. I went up on stage and did it for a year. Realized it wasn't my hustle. I didn't want to participate. I did good in terms of making people laugh, but it wasn't my hustle. Okay. Then I tried other things. I tried taking the GMAT. Maybe I want to go be, be a business guy, go to MBA school. You try things. And when I hit voiceover and tried that, I was like, oh, I like this. This is something different. So at that point, I created a plan. My plan was eliminate all my college debt, start taking down credit card debt, save two grand and take classes. So then I started taking classes. So that's when I started planning my exit, man. And um, from there, you start taking classes, you start honing your craft. And then uh, I took that leap because at that point, I educated myself in about a year and a half of classes. I saved up enough money. I realized that, oh man, three and a half years into this corporate job, it's not my get down. So I had to, uh, I had to jump, you know, and jumping was almost a forced jump. You sometimes tend to create your exits. Yeah. So I created my exit. All right, cool, man. So what was it about voiceover that made you decide like, yes, this is it. This is what I want. This is what I was looking for. You know, man, when I was growing up, you're always told to follow what you're are passionate about what you love you know and it's very cliche it's overused and i still believe it to this day however there was a quote by mark cuban it's a great quote and he says um time is the most important asset that you will never own it's a great quote it is and i live by that quote now because i value time over everything and when you value time over everything you come to quick to realize that you're passionate about many things. I'm passionate about all kinds of shit, man. I'm passionate about doing my philosophy videos or passionate about voiceover, passionate about playing basketball, passionate about all kinds of things. But you learn in life that you can't devote all your time to one passion or you can't devote it to multiple passions and expect to master that passion. If you want to play that game of mastery, you got to pick one. So how do you pick one? Well, I hit voiceover and voiceover let me know that, hey, this is something that I kind of like enough to learn. I kind of like enough to study. I kind of like enough to sacrifice going out and doing shit so I can just do voiceover. So you kind of just got to figure out what you kind of like enough to devote your time to is what I'm trying to get at. All right. Great, great. And I talked to you about two weeks back. And then the next day, I see uh, a post on uh, Facebook from you talking about how to the day that is like the seven year anniversary of you getting into yeah. voiceover. What were some of the high points and low points of that journey? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, man. Um, I was scrolling through my business CRM platform and I saw that job and that job was dated August 10th, 2007. And I was like, whoa, like 10 years. You know, I remember getting my first job. That journey, when you reflect on your journey, especially when you've made it from absolutely zero dollars to a lot more dollars to simplify that journey to climb that, when you reflect on it, there's a lot of lessons, a lot of humility, a lot of sacrifice, everything in it. So when I reflected on my personal journey, I mean, the downs were, bro, I mean, it took me two years to book one job. You know what I mean? It took me thousands of auditions. It took me nights after night. I'd go to work. I'd wake up at five, drive for an hour and a half, two hours, go to work, come back, drive another two hours, and then hit my studio and audition for four or five hours and make zero dollars. And I did it for almost two years. So that persistence and belief, you know what I mean? It was built through that just repetitive practice and that repetitive grind and belief making no money my first job i booked was like a hundred and something dollars bro and i sat back and i was had tears in my eyes because it let me know that hey just keep going you know what i mean and uh, you can do one shit you can do another one and that's yeah. what happened every year my one turned into three three turned into 15 15 turned into 100 and jobs just started climbing so that journey is is uh, very long and I'm still on the journey. I'm by no means done with my journey. I got a lot to learn, lots of, lots of experience, but I continue to travel the journey with um, humility, brother, because without it, uh, I will die. 
Yes, and that was uh, one of your Facebook videos too, humility. Like, mm. where do you get the inspiration for your Facebook videos? Or first of all, let's tell people about your Facebook videos. You have subjects like ego versus self-respect, humility, be a mountain, almost like motivational or whatever's on top of your mind at the moment, correct? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. So besides just the top of your mind, where do you come up with these topics for the Facebook videos that you do? I make them up. I speak to my spirit almost like I'm very in tune with my emotional and spiritual side. I don't mean in a deity. I just mean spiritual in the sense my inner self. And um, for me, uh, you know, these Facebook videos that I post on uh, Facebook.com slash Kabir's voice, um, Man, I started doing them about 10 months ago, 11 months ago, and my Facebook page went from 100 likes to about, you know, 89,000 over those 10 months uh, with various people like people liking my videos in India and Nepal and, you know, parts of like Africa and America. And I utilize um, Facebook advertising. I started uh, learning how to use Facebook advertising, targeted advertising, and I'm still learning. I'm baby in the game, man. But they help me uh, get my message to the people that are more likely to uh, respond to it. In terms of the Facebook video, humility and all these ego battling things that I talk about, uh, it's me just trying to express myself in the most honest way possible. And a lot of it uh, for me is based on my great you know, influencers of philosophers like Alan Watts and Jidu Krishnamurthy. These are uh, great thinkers from you know, 60, 70 plus years ago who um, to this day have evergreen content, meaning that you know, the stuff that they talk about, uh, I at you know 30 years old or I at 60 years old will still be able to talk about ego and humility and um, still be able to talk about battling the ego. Um, I'm motivated by it, brother, because uh, I have seen a lot in my life and my mom is one of my biggest inspirations and her humility in life and her grace is what uh, I, I aspire to carry myself as, you know, just with success, as successful as I'm becoming. And I say that with no ego, but only to make a point that with the success, it is almost my responsibility every day to make sure that I don't cross that line of humility and ego because it's very easy when when you're successful. And I know you touch on it in your video. What is the uh, difference between ego and self-respect? Uh, you know, man, um, self-respect is something that's it's inner. It's internal and it uh, can sometimes be defined only by you. And people can, they can tell if you have self-respect or not, just like they can tell if you have too much ego or not. Um, ego is the negative but equally as powerful as the positive self-respect. Uh, to me, uh, ego and self-respect, they're very much similar on terms of their power. When uh, you recognize someone that has self-respect, it almost motivates you to have more respect for yourself. When you recognize someone to have the negative, which is the ego, too much of ego, if you're wise, you'll uh, learn that, hey, maybe I don't want to live my life with too much ego. And, um, you know, that was, that was something that... Uh, this uh, guy from India messaged me about and asked me to speak about, which was what is the difference between self-respect and ego? And I can only define it as such, um, you know, the negative and the positive, but equally as powerful. Okay, yeah, and that is true. Like, you can always tell when somebody is full of themselves or just, like, you know, confident. And, like, if you're feeling less confident, at least me when I'm around somebody who's confident, I straighten up a little bit, you know? I adjust <laughs> my posture. It's like, okay, let's let's get on the same plane, you know? Absolutely. Either one of them can be contagious in a way. Uh, absolutely, man, and that's something that, I've come to realize that your spirit is very contagious. Your energy is very contagious. So if you're giving out a vibe that's uh, that of too much ego or that of just confidence, you know, your clients, your friends, or your business partners will pick up on it. Uh, I deal with clients and I speak with them every day when I'm in my voiceover sessions. And uh, a lot of them will comment on my attitude. And that's over the years I've come to listen to that and put it in my strength category 
because your clients will let you know what your strengths are. For me, they tell me, hey, man, we really appreciate your attitude. You have better attitude than most uh, voiceover talent that we deal with. Okay, that's pretty cool. Maybe it's because yeah. I, I remain a level of humility. Yeah, definitely, dude, definitely. And you do seem like a very humble guy and confident, you know, so you have both of those working for you. Um, what would you say is probably one of the hardest parts of the voiceover business? Mm. The hardest part of voiceover business would be, uh, I guess, for me, I would have to reflect and say the ability to learn – everything what i mean is there used to be a time in voiceover where you just had to be the voiceover guy you had to have the voice you went into a studio there was a mic for you you didn't even have to press buttons there was a guy who pressed the buttons for you you got on the mic you read the script you bounced you got paid now the benefit of technology is you can have your studio in your house and uh, make it really really uh, lucrative however you have to be able to learn and adapt to the vast amount of stuff you have to learn in terms of how to edit voiceover, how to have a home studio and record, how to have plugins and make your voice sound very nice, um, how to uh, perform voiceover, how to deliver copy, how to deal with clients, how to manage your business um invoicing so when i'm really speaking about here you're no longer just a voiceover you are a voiceover business person now you have to run the business you have to be the engineer you have to be the voice actor <laughs> you also have to be the secretary so get ready to do all that that's the hardest part just to learn that not impossible i did it but you have to be able to put the time in Okay, it's funny that you mentioned about that it's not impossible that you just did. I was listening to a podcast today. The podcast was actually Art of Charm. I can't remember the guest's name. Um, but the guest said, the moment you tell your brain it's impossible, it turns off and goes to sleep. It kind of checks out. It's uh. like, okay, I'm done. But if you phrase it to be like, okay... If I were to succeed at this, if I were to get it, what would it look like? Your brain subconsciously starts to try to figure things out. It was talking about being productive in an unfocused state. Mm. So it kind of, I don't know, what I heard today is just was kind of going along with the conversation and had to share that. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's a great point because uh, it's, it's funny because uh, you don't know the power of uh, the words. You know, what I mean, like words have a lot of power or they can have no power and you kind of get to make the choice of the power of those words. So if you're for me, I try to live my life. OK, uh, the positive ones, I give a lot of power to those words. The negative ones, I just don't give power to them. And um, in my life, sometimes to motivate me even more, the negative ones do have some power and they can motivate you. OK, But when I think about impossible, that word impossible. Man, I, I don't laugh at it, but it's just uh, it's almost non-existent to me now because I don't know what isn't possible anymore. I feel like so much is possible, uh, whether it's internally or externally. Uh, the ability for us to explore um, our lives and the lives of others is enhanced every day. So, you know, that's my yeah. perspective on the possible. Definitely a good way to look at it, man. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way about impossible and telling like, I can never do this. I can never do that. You know, I try to stay away from even using those terms. <laughs> That's always works. You dude. know, it's like I, I have the feeling like if you use them enough, you'll start to believe them. Uh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. You know, that's that's one way to try to stay positive. Just try to eliminate those so you're voice actor, poet, and philosopher, all right? You said that uh, you wrote poetry as a kid. Are you still doing that? Absolutely, man. Um, me and my relationship with poetry is one that's very intimate in the sense that uh, it's grown over the years. But I don't write every day, man. I have a lot of poems, some unfinished, some finished, some just written. And finally, uh, this year, I'll be releasing my first poetry video, uh, My Race is Human. And it's something that I've been working on um, for over a year. Uh, I've already ri written it, but I didn't have no music to it. I had no video to it. So 
now I'm finally in the phases of uh, I got the music. I got a lot of video clips and footage just kind of editing and delivering and uh, the vo vocals on it to see how it comes together. So uh, I'll be coming out with a poetry video because I do uh, mention that I'm a poet, but I don't have a lot of my poetry out there, you know, uh, yeah. but it will be coming out this year. All right, cool, man. Uh, you'll have to let me know when that's out, and I'll share that with uh, the uncontained audience and uh, blast that out for you. Oh, absolutely, man. Thanks. The topic of it is very timely to what is going on in the nation. Absolutely, man. Uh, it's funny because I wrote it a few years ago, and, um, you know, it's, it's uh, a good and bad that the timing of it is this year with all the stuff going on in this country or this world. Uh, but that lets you know that, um, you know, the deeper meaning behind it, my race is human. Okay. It really, you know, it, it's beyond, uh, it's beyond anything that you see on the surface. Um, my response to most people when they mention race, religion, politics, and stuff like that, it's very hard for me to see race. I'm an Indian cat. Um, I was born in India. But I was raised in, uh, you know, La Puente and Pomona area. So my surroundings were always multicultural with blacks and Mexicans, um, you know, Filipinos. So I picked up a certain swag. Now I'm an Indian guy who gets paid to voice over almost with an urban African-American sound. So my perception of race is different because I've benefited from all races. I've benefited from the knowledge of whites, blacks, Asians uh indians all combined so when i look back at it i don't know how to define my race other than human because that is the only thing we have in common nowadays is that we are just uh human beings yes and you know that's what i think america is supposed to be just a melting pot like it was said to be in the past but if everybody can learn something from everybody you know and not to sound cheesy but just get along type thing uh I think, you know, that would help a lot. Yeah, and unfortunately, you know, that I'm learning that um, love is equally as powerful as fear, but love is not easily understood as fear. And um, Interesting. You know what I mean? Like, I see love and I feel love and I sense love every day. I go out to the basketball courts and I see how people – They've changed being around me because I express love to them. And some of them in these environments have never really seen love. They go home and they don't see love. They only see fear or hate. So love is hard. It's very hard to understand love. Um, very easy to understand fear. But um, I think if we always relate ourselves as human beings. I think you can make that love shine, man. And uh, I, I see it. I see it in my sphere of influence daily. You know, whether it's me and one person on the basketball court or someone affecting me in a lovable way, man. I've had so many people show me love in my life. Yeah. It's amazing. Like, I, Dude, I would not be anywhere with anything without the amount of love that people have shown me in my life, man. People have helped me in ways I could never forgive um, from teaching me how to be a better man to, you know, when my pops passed away to helping me uh, understand what that, how to deal with it. Um to teaching me about manhood, to teaching me how to fight, to also teaching me about compassion and love. So, um, man, <laughs> love will carry us further than anything in life, I believe. Wow. Yeah. Well said. Well said, man. So you have went through a struggle. I believe you said it was seven years to get to where you are in uh, voiceover right now. Correct? Yes. Okay. Now, what advice would you give to somebody who is looking to get started out in voiceover, such as Absolutely. such as myself? Sure, man. Okay. Uh, right off the bat, to give you the the real stuff that you guys can focus on here when you want to start. Okay. So understand the industry is changing rapidly. Um, what used to be, uh, you have to go down to LA and go inside studios to learn voiceover. And to have a business and have a studio is now you can have it at your house. But what this means is, is that you really have to dedicate a lot of learning, a lot of learning in two categories, the performance and also the business, two separate categories. Um, for, here's some tidbits for the business side. You should know Voices.com. 
you should know Voice123. Two sites that are leading uh, online casting sites that you pay a yearly fee to, um, put up your demos, and you get auditions daily. You must know these two sites because they're big players in the game. And if you want to learn the game, you got to know the players. So those are that's a little tidbit there. Second thing, uh, pick up that book, The Art of Voice Acting by James Allberger, just so that you can learn the history of voiceover and uh, how the business works in terms of agents and casting directors and know these terms. You've got to know these terms. Third, um, start learning uh, about Adobe Audition or Logic Pro or a free service, um, Audacity. Learn these uh, audio editing platforms. Start taking YouTube or lynda.com, whatever you can find, so that you're able to get a basis on vocal uh, recording and editing. These are very important. And then uh, check out some of the podcasts out there. We have VO Buzz Weekly. We have um, Voices.com, I believe, has a podcast or used to have a podcast. Uh, there's EdgeStudio.com. is a great resource for free scripts, for uh, great content, uh, rate information, and how to get demos. So learn these things. Uh, in terms okay. of coaches, I'll give you one more tidbit. Uh, Bill Holmes in Voiceover Doctor in Los Angeles, if you want to start somewhere, is a great coach and I'd recommend it. All right, cool. I will uh, try to get all of that information in uh, my show notes so people can check it out. And yeah, so you say voiceover is constantly changing and stuff like that. And it's like, I kind of experienced that when I first went into a voiceover class because I came in with seven years of radio experience, which is completely different than, you know, what you might have gone in thinking that voiceover was with like the big voice or like the Sunday, Sunday, Sunday <laughs> type voice or the, the announcery voice. It's not, it's laughed at pretty much in voiceover nowadays, unless it's in parody. Yeah, man. Um, it's something that, you know, you understand is going to happen to me 20 years from now, which is that trends change. Uh, market demands something different. The market target audience of clients and customers and is all changing. Companies want to target differently. There's new lingo. There's new styles. Uh, announcer read was something that was very, very common. Now, no one's looking for announcer. They just want a regular person. They want you to sound like a human being. They don't want you to sound like a robotic or, hey, come on down and buy this car. <laughs> kind of want you to be like, hey, man, come on down and buy this car, you know? It's yeah, uh, yeah. a difference in attitude, and that attitude is acting, and that attitude is also understanding yourself as a human being. And uh, getting the announcery out of my voice is one of the things I can I have had to work on the most. I try to work on them in my uh, show intros, but uh, the not sounding too flat, but not sounding too announcery. It's it's a process, man. It's a process, and uh, it's something you have to work at. Man, absolutely, and we all have to work on it. I, I certainly spend a lot of time working on um, getting out of a sounding announcer. And people, they won't understand how hard it is when until you actually put up a script in front of you and you read that script. When it's not your words, when you don't know what, this, what it's even talking about, you have to make it sound believable. And making it sound believable can be a challenge. Yeah. However, there's a lot of uh, techniques out there, including analyzing the pace at which you uh, say a sentence. Sometimes that could be announcery. Announcers have a type of cadence or they may pause effect. So there's all these things you can analyze. The pace, you can analyze the energy and the cadence of it, the rhythm of a sentence. Um, it's pretty interesting when you get into it, man. Yeah, definitely. Okay, is it, is it weird to you that uh, I find it hard to get into the conversational tone while I am reading a script just in my normal voice. But if I do it as a character, I can read it more conversational. <laughs> Brother, I'm, I, I understand that so deeply. And I'm going to tell you why I'm at the opposite. A lot of people in voiceover are the same, same as you. When they get into a character, they can make it sound pretty believable. Now, why is that? 
Um, before I answer that question, I would say, okay, so people uh, are exactly like that. When they read uh, just a normal script that calls for, say, a thoughtful read or a conversational, heartfelt read, they have a hard time. But when they read it in an imaginary character, it's amazing. For me, it's opposite. For me, it's actually when I do a character, bro, I suck. I'm not that good at doing characters. I'll be straight up. Like, I'm not good at doing uh, animated characters or cartoon characters. I can do them, but my bread and butter is just me. And yeah. I tend to fall towards more of the category of, oh, I sound, I make it sound real when I just am talking like Kabir. Because I, I don't, when I'm reading a script, I don't see and I don't imagine. A lot of people have visual th thoughts, right? They, they see the setting and the environment of which they're speaking. I just feel. For me, it's a feeling. Um, I just need to access my emotion bag. So if that script is calling for a sad emotion, I got a sad emotion. A sad emotion might be where my voice is kind of intimate and I'm just um, speaking at a certain pace. So that may be a, a different type of emotion. Conversational reads, you got to understand that um, the best way to access that is to access yourself and to really be in tune with your emotions. If you can do that, your conversational read will be better. When you do it as a cartoon character, maybe you're not judging yourself. Maybe you're completely outside the box so it sounds real. Yeah. But when you're just being yourself, if you're not comfortable with yourself, it's going to sound red. And that's the problem. You got to be comfortable with yourself. I have never been more comfortable with myself than I am today. That's awesome, man. I think to me, it's, I feel like I'm not doing enough with my voice or something like that. When I'm just talking and trying to record, it's like, is this what it's supposed to sound like conversational? But if I'm add the layer of a character to it, I feel like I'm doing something to my voice so I can kind of relax and do the conversational read. I don't know. It's kind of a mind fuck. <laughs> it can be, man. It really <laughs> can be. And I encourage anybody listening to, uh, you know, just fuck around. Take a recorder and read the back of a magazine or an article out loud and really record and then hear yourself reading something, maybe a hundred words or something. And you'll be surprised, man, uh, the things you can learn through listening and analyzing your own recordings over time. You begin to get intimate with it. You begin to analyze your sound and understand how when you're speaking a certain way or when you're feeling a certain feeling, how that reflects through your voice. And it can be almost psychedelic because uh, <laughs> uh, it's trippy what the microphone can show you that just human ear or um audio reference couldn't yes definitely and uh it like you notice more of the hisses and the pops and whatever like yeah all your insecurities will come out for sure and you know as you listen to your voice more and more it does get more comfortable but at first it's like the first time i heard myself on the radio it was like i sound like that <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, it it is a trip. And record yourself, listen to it, take uh, Kabir's advice right there. So Kabir, like running your business, what do you do to promote yourself as well? One as a business and as a voiceover actor. Oh, absolutely. Um, as a voiceover actor and as a business, I would say my website. I mean, my website and my demos are primary. Um, and what I mean by a website, if you look at my website, kabirsvoice.com right now, it is freshly updated, freshly new, uh, compared, compared to what it was maybe, uh, let's say seven months ago. And seven months ago, what I had was good for about four years, meaning that as I've gotten more successful, I'm constantly updating my promo materials. My demos are freshly up to date. I have all my new jobs on there. Um, clients that I've actually worked for um, mixed into my commercial demo or my explainer video or e-learning demos. These are different categories in voiceover. Uh, my website is uh, looking fresh, man. I've redesigned it. I've got all my agents up there. I've got great uh, placements of my social media and uh, my Facebook, you know, 89,000 likes in the corner. That's all these impressive. things are 
<laughs> oh, oh, thank you, brothers. It's all uh, doable if you just learn the little system, whether it's Facebook advertising or whatever. Um, I put these things up there because if you understand a business mindset, right? You're a client, you're a freelancer. You come upon my website and uh, you see, oh, okay, this guy has, he has all the demos. He has all the work. He has the testimonials. Oh, and he also has a good Facebook following. These are all ways that just validate your authority in the industry. These are ways to just validate validate your worth. So in terms of promoting yourself, I say demos and website are key. All right, yeah, and you have some like big uh, clients that you've worked with too, including like Under Armour, Pepsi, uh, LG, uh, Sam Adams, the Memphis Grizzlies. And yeah, <laughs> that one was a surprise to me when I found out about that. And then, I don't know, Boys and Girls Club, Bud Light, Quicksilver, and a number of others. I'm, I'm scrolling through them right now. Yeah, so you have definitely have like all the uh, clients on your website to back it up, too. You have to. I mean, you can, again, you can come with one thing or you can come with all things. And I need to come with all things, meaning my website's got to be good. My demo's got to be good. My social media, at least some part of it has to be good. For me, you go on my Twitter, it's almost non-existent. You go on my Instagram, a little bit non-existent. Um, I can't do it all, but I'm trying. And for me, I focus one at a time with Facebook has been my main focus because I've gotten the most response from people. Now I get messages from all kinds of people. Um, and, you know, that just adds to me, uh, to my business. It just adds to Kabir's Voice Inc. now is being promoted in all ways. So whether it's f philosophy videos through Facebook or I'm working on a podcast, it's not out yet, but it's going to take a couple months. But there's another method. There's the YouTube channel is going to be created all these ways you have to keep grinding and out for your business. And, um, you know, I don't see any other way to do it but to just kind of go in there and start working it from the beginning. Right on, man. Right on. So say you don't have any big clients just getting started off. What would you put on your website? Absolutely. So first of all, before you get into any, you need to come at it from a resource standpoint, right? So let's just assume, let's assume you got $1,000, I'm not going to encourage you to go spend any of that money on a website right now. What I'm instead going to do is encourage you to go learn voiceover right now. So you go spend 300 for a six week class. You go spend another maybe 100 or 200 for an hour of private consult from whoever, uh, whether it be a coach, a tech person in voiceover, so that you can cut your learning curve down. One of the biggest assets to my business was I'd get a $200 job. I take a hundred, put it aside so I can get a private consult with a, a leading expert in a tech category. Well, why? Well, that one hour hour with them saved me eight hours of trying to go learn uh, plugins or Logic Pro by myself. Okay. See, the, the hour that I gave him for a hundred and twenty five dollars, uh, he just saved me nine hours worth of learning. So you have to. Uh, Think from a resource standpoint at what level you're at. Now, if you already know voiceover and you're saying you got the chops and you can get on the mic, you're good. Okay, go spend the money on a website. And if you don't have anything, take some of that thousand, go save another 500 or 750 more. And now you need to get go get a demo made. They cost anywhere between a thousand and two thousand, depending on who you go to. And that's that's absolutely necessary. But you better be good enough for that demo. Otherwise, that demo is no good. Okay. Yeah. So, and if you're spending between one thousand and two thousand on a demo, you want to make damn sure that you're ready. So, spend all the money out. You don't come out with a basically lump of crap. I came out with a lump of crap when I first started. It was terrible. I listen to it now. I laugh at it because I I was there. I thought I was ready. Paid twenty two hundred for a demo. It got me maybe one job, two jobs. Uh, gave me a good start. But now I look back and I'm like, ooh, I should have never made it. I wasn't ready. Okay, so um, real quick, one more question along this line. Uh, what should you do if you don't have a demo? Say you're on Voices123 or Voices.com and you don't have a professional demo. What would be a step? Obviously, you're going to want to take classes. But say you want to try to audition for jobs. What would be something you could do? I'm going to give you the answer that some may not like, but it's the answer that's going to save you time and bullshit, which is 
you shouldn't be on the fucking website then. And I, and I mean that with just pure honesty, and this is the reason I can say that. You're going into a pool of very hungry and very talented sharks. You go in that pool half-ass, or you go in that pool with not a matching resources, you're not going to do well. You're going to drown. You're going to eat you alive. Now, I encourage you, if you're in that position, to control your mental game of, oh, man, I'm not booking no auditions. I'm making no money, blah, 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 and really hone in on mastering your craft. You really have to hone in. Uh, having a demo is not even an option. It's it's actually mandatory. So if you're not good enough to get that mandatory demo, you need to take a step back and go get good enough to go make that mandatory demo. All right. Well, sometimes the truth hurts. <laughs> it hurts, brother. It hurts. Because look at it, man. I'm... I'm Bro, I'm not afraid of my competition and my comp, and I let my competition know. Some of my good friends in voiceover, look, man, if you coming with it and I'm coming with it to the mic, let the best man win because I'm bringing it. I'm bringing it. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not just gonna bring half ass. So if you have people like that, and there are a few of the top talent with a mentality like me, and let's just say you're an urban talent, and there's a ten thousand dollar job on the table. You're going to have to deal with somebody like Kabir Singh, and Kabir Singh is not going to come come lightly. So you cannot come lightly. You better come hard. And uh, if you if you win and if you get the job, hey, man, you deserve it. And there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Cool, man. So what would you say? Uh, what would you say a highlight or two of your career has been so far? Ah, it's a good question. Um, one of the highlights, man. Mm. This is a uh, earlier this year, I did a voiceover casting, and uh, because I've signed NDAs and whatnot, I, I'll just say that the name of the company was Project Snapple. The company rhymed with Snapple, so let's call it Project Snapple. Project okay. Snapple uh, was a uh, uh, casted through agencies, casting directors, and I got it, and I got it, and I was like, "Whoa, this is pretty trippy." I was looking for a poet, and I was like, "God, oh, dude, that." This is like perfect. Are you kidding me? So like it was me. Got my agent involved. My agent and uh, I negotiated with Mr. Project Snapple. And then Mr. Project Snapple flew me out to San Francisco uh, to their headquarters and had a car pick me up and put me up in a hotel. And I did um, some live poetry in their one of their big stores in front of a, uh, a bunch of extras, about 100 extras and actors and actresses and models for a commercial shoot and it turned into be uh, uh, an on-camera thing. And during that experience, man, I never had so many people afterwards line up to talk to me. It was, it was a humbling but trippy-ass experience because I've never experienced it. I'm a cat who was bullied as a kid and I've got my ass beat all the way up until college, you know what I'm saying? So like, I never got no attention from people. I never had models wanting to come up and talk to me. So for that experience, it was very trippy for me because yeah, I, I don't know how to handle or deal with it. But I dealt with it, and it was a beautiful reminder of, uh, of how people responded to the truth that I hopefully speak. Um, and to all that say, that experience was definitely in highlight, man, because it, it fueled my spirit for at least the next 20 years, brother, because <laughs> having people line up and just wanting to speak to me and uh, have a conversation with me lets me know that I'm putting something of worth out there. So I can't take I can't take it for granted. I gotta stay on my path and keep going the way I'm doing it. Um, with all that said, the saddest moment was at the end of the day when I got back and got paid and everything was good. A month went by and I wasn't even in the commercial. <laughs> so, oh man. So that was the saddest uh, uh, there was th because they shot many different people, about eight different talent, different types. One was a poet, me. The other one was a graphic designer who did everything on an iPad. And there was other types of musicians. And I didn't make the cut for the final edit. So that was a great reminder because when I left there, my confidence was beaming. I felt great. I felt, man, I accomplished. I even got paid quick. But when I saw the cut, it was a nice reminder from uh, the universe that, hey, Stay your ground. Stay humble. It's it's an illusion. And remembering that it's an illusion is very important in life. 
And that was a great reminder for me, brother, because it taught me to always keep perspective that this is a game and this is an illusion. So all the shit that people give you in good and bad, take it with a grain of salt and just move cautiously. Right on, man. Right on. Yeah. It's like, I just find myself sitting listening because it's like, it. I could tell that you have poetry in your background because it's like, I'm just sitting listening, like expecting, and now deep thoughts. <laughs> 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 so I'm like, yeah, yeah. That, damn, that sounds good. Oh, shit. I got to talk now. <laughs> 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 all right That's so funny, man. yeah man um so i got a couple more questions here for you so when your audience hears your voiceover spots or your voiceover ads what do you want them to take away or remember about your performance if it's my voiceover spots um i would say just know that the person that's voiced in any of those spots is the person that you're going to meet in person. I mean, like, there's no character. There's no artificialness. Uh, that's me. That's my style. That's my cadence. That's my rhythm. That's how I speak. Uh, there's no, there's nothing that's fake there. So hopefully it's authentic in its delivery. Um, I'm the current voice of T-Mobile uh, for the customer service. So if you got a T-Mobile phone, you call T-Mobile, you're going to hear me. You may hear a, a slightly more professional Kabir, but uh, you'll still hear me. Um, and you know, just connect with me, connect with the human. If it's with philosophy videos, again, know that that's me. That's, uh, I'm sharing my heart and my spirit. I'm sharing, um, the lessons I'm learning and the lessons people have taught me from what I've taught myself. And, um, hopefully doing it in a graceful and, uh, humble way. Um, so that, you know, I just, I hope that those things shine through my work in whatever it is, because, uh, sometimes you can get caught up in the bullshit and, you know, everybody slips. And if I slip, I hope to be, uh, forgiven. <laughs> yes, man. Um, don't we all? <laughs> so you're the voice on the T-Mobile, uh, phone service. Like when you yeah. call in, you're that Customer guy, the guy, guy that people are like, operator, operator <laughs> agent so you're that guy all right i'm that's, that guy you, that's good to know that's good to know <laughs> um <laughs> so i have one final question for you but before i get to that question kabir just one more time where can people get a hold of you where can they check out your videos and where will they be able to find your poetry piece when it comes out absolutely um, so my website is kabirsvoice.com, K-A-B-I-R-S voice.com. And, um, that's all, it has all my links to my Facebook, facebook.com slash kabirsvoice. I'm not really on Twitter and Instagram that much yet, but there, you can also find me at kabirsvoice on those platforms. And, um, on my website, you'll find all my voiceover work and you'll also find my philosophy videos under philosophy, um, in terms of the poetry, once that's out, it'll also be on my Facebook and my website. So you'll find them on there, man. And I just continue to uh, publish them, again, Facebook and uh, my website, and eventually onto YouTube. And that's kabirsvoice.com, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So once again, I'll put that in the show notes so people can find you easily and uh, check out the work that you've done. Uh, you'll be surprised to see how many uh, companies he's done work for. Time for that final question, Kabir. It is the title question of the show. Kabir Singh, how do you live uncontained? <laughs> how do I live uncontained? You know, man, um, To live uncontained, to live with like no barriers, no uh, limits. Uh, it's a very internal uh, experience for me to live uncontained because I have to accept it. I have to be willing to accept that, hey man, there's no rules to this game. This game of life, this game of business, this game of voice acting. And um, my destiny is in my hands. My responsibility is in my hands. My failures as well as my successes are on me. Not to say that there haven't been people to contribute to those successes, but at the end of the day, to be uncontained for me means to take full responsibility and accountability for my choices in pursuit of my dreams and in pursuit of my goals and ambitions. That if I fail, I fail because of me. And um, 
my spirit is uncontained. I, I, I feel like a slave who's been unshackled in terms of my mental and my spiritual. Um, I seek to learn as much as I can from other people. I seek to uh, battle myself in terms of my ego as much as I can daily. And you have to in, in order to be uncontained. And a part of that uncontainment, you got to also have a certain, uh, a certain friendship with fear. Me and fear are very friendly. I'm okay with being fearful, man. Um, I spent my whole life being fearful of a lot of things, whether it's somebody whooping my ass or, you know, fearful of my environment. Um, for me to live uncontained means to embrace my fears and to stand right next to them and to smile at fear. And uh, I think that helps me live uncontained. I like that. I like that. Stand next to fear and smile at fear, man. Yes, sir. Thank you once again for coming on and uh, talking to me, Kabir. I know, as uh, you said, Mark Cuban said, time is the most valuable asset you can't <laughs> own. But yes, thank sir. you for sharing yours with me. And Likewise, man. Anytime, man. Anytime you want to come back on, you are welcome. And I have one final thing for you to do. Absolutely. Kabir, will you do me the honor of signing off the show tonight? I am Kabir Singh, and I live uncontained. Much respect to my host, man. You've done uh, a great job interviewing me, brother, and I equally appreciate your time and uh, you. the value that you bring, man. And that wraps up another episode of Uncontained. Thank you to Kabir for joining me today, and thank you for listening. And it was it was a fun episode. I dig the poetry that he does as well, along with the philosophy videos on Facebook. If you haven't checked those out, uh, you should. If you're having a bad day, it might be the thing to lift you up and make your day a little bit better. So you can check him out at his website, kabirsvoice.com, or on Facebook, all those links will be in the show notes. And if you've enjoyed the show and want to support the show, please uh, find us on iTunes or your favorite pod player. Subscribe, rate, review, share. Share is a big one. Help get the word out about the show and more people, more people listening, more earbuds in ears with uh, the show going into them. That's the that's the big goal right there. And also, if you stop by uncontainedpod.com please make sure you click on that amazon banner at the top of that page or or the audible banner that uh, you can get a free trial to audible for but thank you for listening and as always live uncontained <laughs>